Hello, I'm doing a book review, and the book I want to review is Gothic Tales. Now, this is a collection of three short stories by legendary horror author Howard Phillips Lovecraft, better known as H.P. Lovecraft. And those stories are The Outsider, The Music of Eric Zan, and The Terrible Old Man. Now, this is a modern collection published in 2022. However, all three of these stories were originally published all the way back in the 1920s. Now, this is actually part of a line of books from the same company. I have another collection, also called Gothic Tales, which contains three Edgar Allan Poe stories, and I have a Gothic Tales collection that collects two Mary Shelley stories. Now, during Lovecraft's life, most of his stories were published in literary magazines and periodicals, but over the decades, his stories have been anthologized countless times in so many different collections, and in fact, all three of the stories in this collection I also have in this collection called H.P. Lovecraft The Complete Fiction. I'll admit, the reason I got this collection, even though I already had all three of these stories in the other Lovecraft collection, is simply because I like the cover a lot. Now, not so much during his lifetime, but in the decades since he's died, Lovecraft has become, I would argue, the most influential horror writer of the first half of the 20th century. And he has created a whole mythology that is still being discussed and analyzed to this day. Unfortunately, to kind of address the elephant in the room about him, he was notoriously kind of a racist. But fortunately, and people might disagree with me on this, I don't think his views necessarily bleed through, at least not into the three stories that I'll be talking about tonight. Now, normally when I review short story collections, I review each individual story in said collection, and I'm doing the same here, but I decided to try out a little experiment. When I talk about each of these stories, it's going to cut to me discussing the story with a different friend of mine, but I'm going to try to do a different friend for each story. Alright, so for this section of the video, I'm discussing the short story The Outsider by H.P. Lovecraft with my friend Chris Espinall. Hello. Uh, now, this story was originally published in Weird Tales in 1926, and apparently it was written sometime in 1921, so the story, for all intents and purposes, is over 100 years old now. Now, this story, I think H.P. Lovecraft said that he was specifically inspired by Edgar Allan Poe, and you can definitely see the Poe influence on this, especially stuff like The Mask of the Red Death. I also saw an influence of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein on this story. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a, I was about to say that. It has a lot of, uh, um... Those type of um, it gives those types of vibes, you know. Just it's it feels like p just pure gothic literature right there. You know, yeah. Gothic horror li literature. You can see that he wears it in his glove, like all his influences. That is, it, and at a time he openly admitted and said, you know. He had a pole face. You know? Yeah. So a few of his, his short stories. So the plot of the story is we follow this guy who narrates the story, and he doesn't really seem to remember where he came from or even who he is, like what his real name is. And as far as he can remember, he's basically spent most of his life in what at first we're led to believe is a castle, but he ends up... One night, he decides to venture out, and he ends up at this party, and I really can't say too much else about the story without giving it away, because the story's only a few pages long, but we are going to be giving away spoilers in this uh, review anyway, but uh, basically, it turns out that this guy is some kind of a zombie or a ghoul, and he literally came out of a crypt, and... The way he finds out is really interesting. Like, when he's at the party, he sees the people, like, shrieking in fear at the sight of him, and he doesn't know why. And then he turns around and sees what at first he thinks is a monster, and then realizes it's a mirror he's looking at. What do you think of this story? One of the things that I like about it is, um, we don't really have too much, um, 
information on the protagonist of the story, the narrator of the story. We don't really know too much about him. We don't really know his origins. We we do get little hints and things like there. He has spent time reading, and he has heard stories, or as or came across uh, what this new world is to him. You know, the experience of the sun. And things like uh, of that nature. So it's kind of like, um, what is to say this person is even human to begin with? You know, I mean, we don't even have that much, you know. That's probably the, I'm feeling from Frankenstein. One of the things is, um, he's the monster, but he has no ill will or attention. He just wants to... He's lonely, and no, he just wants you know, to, like... He just wants to experience, you know... Life. Life. Yeah. What, he, what he read up. What, what was this? What was that? So it's completely alien world. As the story goes, they all ran from him because he's this grotesque monstrosity. You know, and also the tragic thing is he goes back. Yeah. He goes back, you know what I mean? Rather than, than have some type of um, vile hatred, like, as a, like Frankenstein or... Um, this creature, he feels that he's so repulsed from his own reflection now seeing himself and seeing what they fear. Now he, uh, instead of having that hatred, he goes back. As yeah. if he's doing them a favor as well. Feeling himself that he wouldn't be able to fit in, which is a tragedy because that's all he ever th wanted. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's all he ever read. That's all he ever... Mm -hmm. You know, what do you strive to push for? Yeah, it's a very tragic and sad story. Mm. But also genuinely creepy, because, like, imagine, like, you don't know what you are, and then you realize you're some kind of hideous monstrosity. Like, what would that actually be like? Yeah, yeah. yeah. To realize that. It's, 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 that's the thing that's so weird about that story is, maybe it's a dead person that's, you know, it could be a dead a zombie or some sort, been locked away. Maybe it could be a moment of, like, like memory loss and some bits and pieces are the things that it remembers. You know what I mean? Now, Lovecraft really popularized the subgenre of cosmic horror. Yeah. But this one seems to be a little light on the cosmic horror. I'm not sure if you could pick up any cosmic horror elements from this one. No, not really. It feels it feels like he was getting his um his gothic horror out, you know. Yeah. I mean, he went through a Poe phase and he, you know, it, it it feels like everything that you mentioned before, you know, Mary Shelley. It feels like, you know, Poe. It feels Poeish. It feels, you know, it has that feeling. Mm -hmm. the, it, again, Lovecraft has this. A lot of people. Some there's some people that kind of say weird things about it, but I like Lovecraft's over his his obsessiveness to 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 put description because he doesn't describe the main character, but he describes the journey, what it took for him to push out where he came from. You know, I mean, he described the amount of effort, you know, the willingness that this this creature, or this person is, you know, is, is striving for. And then the pain and the loss and, and the return of it. You know, I mean, there's a lot of, it evokes a lot of emotion behind it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the tragic horror, it, just, it fits perfectly within the gothic literature. But very descriptive. Very descriptive. Yeah. Even down to the to the point where his his fingers first experience the touch of, of a reflection. Yeah, like when he touches yeah, the mirror, like the way Lovecraft describes that. Describes it, you know, it's... A now, I do want to point out that in 1950, there was the Richard Matheson short story, Born of Man and Woman, which reminded me a lot of this. Now, this was adapted into a 1995 Stuart Gordon film called Castle Freak. Now, Stuart Gordon did a lot of H.P. Lovecraft adaptations like Reanimator and From Beyond and Dagon. I'm pretty sure he did Dagon, but uh, uh, the movie also starred Jeffrey Combs and Barbara Crampton, who were both in Reanimator and From Beyond. Uh, it was a full moon movie, which is the same company that did all the Puppet Master movies. Oh. You didn't get a chance to see it, right? No, I didn't get a chance to see that movie. It's an interesting movie. I I I liked it. Uh, it's definitely not one of my my favorite Stuart Gordon movies, but it was interesting. But it's very loosely based on the story. Yeah, like I was it, about to ask you, what exactly did they adapt? Honestly, not much. It's I'm only talking about it because it's considered to be a loose adaptation. 
like, okay, the creature in the movie, the castle freak, is sort of based on the ghoul from The Outsider. At the same time, he's not really intelligent in the movie. He doesn't really, like, he's not as well-spoken. And also, there doesn't, it's not really supernatural. Like, when you find out the origin of the castle freak, it's, again, it's not really supernatural. And actually, his backstory in the movie is really, really fucked up. Mm. Uh, but it, it, again, it's an interesting movie. Uh, but, yeah, but it, it only takes see, like basic yeah. elements from the book. Like uh, there's a point in the movie where he does see his reflection in the mirror and he breaks the mirror. That's like the only real thing that it seems to take from the original story. Uh, Honestly, the creature in the movie reminded me a lot of the creature from Barbarian, and I'm wondering if uh, maybe Barbarian was partly inspired by Castle Freak. Man, now you have me thinking about that. (laughs) You you have me thinking about it. I never connected that before, because I haven't seen Castle Freak, but I did see him with the creature, and now I'm thinking about the, the, um, the creature in Barbarian. I'm like, you know? But, um, you know, based on the way you describe the movie, like, it, it does fall f- far away from the uh, source material because based on, uh, at least based on what we know, this this person had a, uh, was able to develop some form of education. Yeah. He had an awareness of the outside, so which means he had a, a form of intellect. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm just, we're just playing off that the narrator is him, it's, it's mm-hmm. him you know, speaking in, in his mind. So he, um, his thoughts and everything, it's, you know, it doesn't show sign of a, um, a weak-minded individual. You know. Now, there was a remake of Castle Freak in 2020. Uh, I never saw the remake, but apparently the remake has even more Lovecraftian elements than uh, the 1995 film. Like, the remake is actually... Apparently more so based on the Dunwich Horror, from what I heard, and oh. yogg Safog actually does show up in the Castle Freak remake, apparently. There's also a 2019 short film based on this story, which I'm assuming is probably a lot closer to the source material than the Stuart Gordon film, and I know there were some comic book adaptations of this story as well. Have you ever read any of those? Yeah, I came across... Um I just recently discovered this manga artist. He's an he's a horror artist. Um, he adapts a lot of the H.P. Lovecraft's um, weird tale stories, and and he had, he adapted a few shorts and he put it in a, in a manga format. Um, the artist, I, I I'm sorry that I can't give out the name because I I really don't remember the name. But uh, nowadays, I I heard there's been a rise in in in. Um, people more interested in Lovecraftian and things now. Like, there's there's movie projects being pushed. Oh, yeah, there's definitely been a rise in, like, cosmic horror. I mean, yeah. the Outwaters uh, yeah. that came out recently. E- even Skinamarink, to a degree. Eh, to you a know. degree. It depends on how you want to interpret that movie. Yeah. But, yeah, that was our uh, review of The Outsider. Uh, the next segment of this video, I'll be discussing the music of Eric Zan. So, for this section of the video, I'm discussing the short story, The Music of Eric Zan, and I'm discussing this story with Bill Burns. Hi, everyone. Now, The Music of Eric Zan was originally published in The National Amateur in 1922. Now, Bill, before we get on to our thoughts of this particular story, the reason I want you in this video is I know you're like a diehard Lovecraft fan, so why don't you just talk about Lovecraft's work in general and why he appeals to you so much? Sure. Well, um, I mean, one of the things is that there's that philosophy behind what he's doing. He's not just looking for the cheap scare or even just a physical scare. Like, well, a lot of horror is about, you know, fear of what happens to the body, uh, mortality. His... Um, you know, horrors are much more uh, cosmicism, right? This idea that we are insignificant in the cosmos. The cosmos doesn't uh, care about us. That if we even knew the real truth and the real reality of what surround us, we'd go mad or we would embrace ignorance, you know? So that was one of the things I really um, responded to. I mean, initially when I read it, I just liked the, like the, his imagery and his atmosphere, I think is brilliant, you know? But as I read more and I, I learned more about him, I really realized that there was something much more deeper behind his stories than just pulp, you know, horror. 
Oh, yeah, there's definitely a sense of nihilism to his stories. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the things that fascinates me about his work and how the monsters in his work, and yeah, I don't think Lovecraft literally believed in these monsters or gods, but the monsters in his stories represent existential dread. Up to this point, horror was, even if though we were being attacked by something, we still had significance. Like, Dracula needs us for blood. Even though Dracula will destroy us, Dracula needs us for blood. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, in some ways, like the monsters and the, and the evil that we, you know, the, Satan wants our souls, the devil wants. So like we were still necessary, even though the monster was trying to destroy us. Human beings were still central. Right. So, human beings still had significance, even in the face of these things. Lovecraft comes along and he says, no, human beings have no significance whatsoever. That's the deeper horror, because even though Dracula tries to drain our blood, we're still important. We're still necessary. We're still needed yeah. in Lovecraft's work, which and it's funny because Eric Zahn was one of I think one of the first stories where he really started to refine this cosmicism you know i think earlier on he the cosmicism was there but it wasn't refined yet like it was just there he wasn't sort of integrating it into the plot and into the characterization of his characters um but that was one of the things right is that we don't understand anything we think we're so amazing we think we're at the top of the food chain we think our consciousness is so you know expansive and we find out was we know nothing we you know and there's that firm that famous first paragraph of call cthulhu which really sort of out outlines his philosophy right there. I mean, if you wanted to see, you know, just sort of an encapsulation of, of Lovecraft's philosophy, that first paragraph, right, of, of um, Cthulhu really sort of sets it out there, you know? And I think, again, we could retrospectively look back and see it, the seedlings of those things all the way through. And I think that Zahn is one of the first stories where you start to see the blossoming, right? Because Lovecraft's, like, his like, classic period really did not start until, like, maybe five or six years after this story, right? When he, when he leaves New York, right? He goes to New York, um, you know, to, to sort of try to live his life. His mother dies, right? So he sort of leaves. He gets married when he's in New York. And so he tries to live his life. And of course, it's a disaster for any number of things. I mean, his temperament, the t what was going on in the country at the time, his in inability to find work. It just was a huge disaster. So he comes back to Providence, right? And it's like almost like this rebirth. It's this renaissance. And that's when he really hits his classic period, right? He writes Cthulhu. He writes Color Out of Space. He starts writing um, Charles Dexter Ward, so it, it, that's really where I see is like like Lovecraft's like prime classic time, and so Zahn's a little bit before that, but you could start to see the momentum rolling towards this kind of cosmic horror. Yeah, and another thing about Lovecraft's work is like it's almost like a natural human thing to want to believe there's something bigger than us in the universe, be that a belief in God or a belief that there's life on other planets, like. There's a lot of people who want to believe that there's more to the universe than what we realize. And there's people who find comfort with that idea that there's something bigger than us. Whereas Lovecraft is almost the exact opposite. He's like, no, you don't want there to be anything bigger than us in the universe. Well, again, it's that sort of that hubris that human beings have, right? That yeah. sort of pride that we're the best we're the highest, we're the superior, we're the supreme. And Lovecraft's like, no, we're not. And I think that really comes back to Lovecraft's own personal um, philosophy, which was mechanical materialism, they called it. So this belief, well, first of all, he was a materialist, right? He said that if you can't, if you can't see it, smell it, touch it, you know, uh, hear it, uh, feel it tactilely, it doesn't exist. So he was a materialist. So he, he did not believe in supernatural. He did not believe in the paranormal. He didn't believe in any of that stuff. And any of that stuff that was an anomaly, I think he felt like, well, it was just something we didn't understand yet, some kind of scientific kind of, um, you know, uh, processes or phenomena we didn't understand yet, you know. But he also b was a mechanical materialist, which he believed that almost like the universe was this giant clockwork that was just running, and it ran like almost like a clockwork kind of uh, machine runs, just keeps running and running and running. And once you once it starts, you don't need anybody to shepherd yeah. it. You know what I mean? It just keeps going. It just keeps grinding along, and that's what he saw the universe as. So he did not see that there was like this, you know, um, grand mechanic or grand architect that you know. Yeah. It was just like it just by chance. It just happened to start this way, and it just kept. We'll just keep going and going, right, forever. This goes back to some of the things that we see in, in Lovecraft's work, where there is no God that saves any of his yeah. narrators, so that any of his main characters. There is nobody that, to save us at all. And again, that's something that you know people have a hard time wrapping their head around, right? They want to believe that there's this guardian, right, that's going to punish the bad and, and, and reward the good. And Lovecraft's like, no. And again, that's why I think Lovecraft's stories are so powerful, because if he was a believer, I don't think his stories would be as... 
uh, as, as horrifying, right? Because he didn't believe he was able to see it from an outsider's perspective. He was able to look at metaphysics. He was able to look at this understanding of like divine justice and, 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 you know, intelligent design, what they call now, right? He was able to have an outsider's perspective of that because he didn't believe in any of it, right? So that's what made him such an efficient, um, I think horror writer because he didn't believe in any of those things. Yeah. He came at it from this yeah. kind of almost like this clinical analytical perspective. So now on to the music of Eric Zan. What is your opinion of this story? Oh, I, I like this story very much. I think it's a real, it's a great story. I love the atmosphere of it. Um, I think it's interesting because it's the, one of the few stories he has set outside of the United States, right? It takes place in Paris, which is interesting because he usually doesn't do that, right? Most of his stories, of course, happen either in, um, you know, New England or in Arkham, right? Arkham country, like his sort of, you know, his his um, fake kind of like geography that he created. Um, but yeah, I think the story is, it's moody, it's atmospheric. I also think it's very interesting. And again, this goes back to this idea that sometimes it's better that you're not so into something to be able to write about it, right? Because Lovecraft really did not, he wasn't a big fan of music. He said he was tone deaf. So again, I think that's one of the interesting things was, is that if Lovecraft was a huge fan of music, maybe the music itself wouldn't be so weird and discordant. But because he wasn't really a fan of music, he really felt he didn't have an ear for it. Um, That's what makes the music so weird and otherworldly, right? And his descriptions of it, you know? If you love something, you're going to describe it in a way that makes it more palatable or something that's going to show your affection for it. But because he really didn't have an affection for it, he's able to describe it in this really sort of weird, strange, eerie way. So the story follows this young man, this university student who's staying at this room or apartment on this mysterious street in Paris. And what's interesting is the whole story is told in past tense, and he says that after the events of this story, he couldn't find this street again, but he ends up encountering this elderly musician and he becomes fascinated with the musician's music and you get this sense that the man's music is almost keeping something at bay or keeping something back. There will probably be spoilers in this review. I mean, the story's literally over 100 years old now. Again, Lovecraft is so brilliant. Like The way he weaves things into the story, even things that are just like implicit, which is, again, I think Lovecraft's usually known for his explicit like monsters and things, but like implicitly how he builds the story, the atmosphere, even the language he uses, right? Like the um, the name of the street, right? The, the, the Rue des Salles, I believe it is. And that's actually a play on the French word for threshold or portal. And again, if you think about the story, it was like there's something in his room that 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 uh, Eric Zahn is playing this music because some portal is opened or he's using the music to open a portal or keep something at bay that's going to come through a portal, right? It's kind of it totally makes sense that he would name it that. Again, it's just brilliant, you know. But again, it's interesting that you said because I think you could read it two ways. One way is that he's trying to keep something at bay, but is he also in some ways playing to something that makes him play to it? Like he's being, like he's being, um, you know, like forced to play this music too, and it kind of reminds me of um, the story Hanshi the Earless from Quaidon, you know, the the anthology Quaidon, where you have the ghosts that make this monk play music for them because it soothes them, it keeps them, you know, it's something that sort of it keeps them connected to um, the living, you know. So I often wondered, was he? playing this to keep something at bay like he's fighting against it or is he doing it because he's been sort of almost commanded or he's being um uh bidden to to do this yeah like how we never get an actual explanation for what is on the other side of this porthole if this even is a porthole like why he has to play the music because there's a point where Eric Zahn is because he's mute so he can't actually communicate this but he tries writing it all down for the university student but then like a gust of wind or something just blows all the papers away and so we never actually know what this is that's actually going on in the story and I think that's also quite brilliant about it too very much so but again Lovecraft is such a genius that he reverses our usual expectations our usual expectations is that silence is scary and sound indicates something that is alive and it's something that we can we can connect with you know but in the story if you notice he makes Zahn the musician mute And the music itself is the thing that is so scary, right? So it's like his silence is important because um, it's, again, that idea of it's better that you are uh, ignorant than know what's really going on. So if Zahn could talk, maybe he could tell the student everything and it would drive the student mad. But it's actually good for the student that Zahn is mute because he he can't get the whole story, right? And it's the music itself which is horrifying rather than the silence that is scary. The student even says at the end of the story that that he's not entirely 
unhappy that he lost that manuscript that Zahn wrote for him. Like, he's kind of glad that the papers got lost because he doesn't want to know. And that's such a typical Lovecraftian protagonist, right? Yeah. That it's better that you don't... Which, again, flies in the face of, like, the Enlightenment reason, like, that human beings are, are you know, beings that think that we not need to know everything. No, you know, to knowledge is the most important thing, and we have to sort of, you know, that we could, you know, uh, tackle any problem if we just have knowledge and use logic and reason. And, again, in Lovecraft's work, it's the exact opposite, which, again, I think is so ironic because Lovecraft himself, I mean, you want to talk about a, a figure that was fashioned in the Enlightenment, Lovecraft, right? Logic, reason, science, those are all the things that he built his sort of um, character on, you know? So it's very interesting that, you know, the horror in his stories is irrationality, right? Is sort of, um, um, you know, not finding these things out or, or finding that your, you know, the way you look at the universe, your sort of lens of looking at the universe is totally wrong. Yeah. You know what I mean? And again, I think that would have been horrifying for him. You know, because again, he built, he thought that he understood how the universe worked. He understood, like, you know, how, um, you know, how these, this, this materialist sort of world, um, you know, operated. And to find out that it wasn't like that. Like, I think it would have been horrifying for Lovecraft to find out that there was a god. I think that would have, like, would have just totally wrecked Lovecraft because it totally destroyed his whole, the way he saw the world. His whole structuring of his understanding of the world would have been shattered. And I think that's what happens to a lot of the protagonists. Like the lucky protagonists are the ones who can at least hold on to a little bit of that old structure they use to understand the world. The really, the, the really uh, tragic protagonists are the ones that are totally shattered and they can't go back. And I also like how in this story we get implications that there's something in this void, but we don't know for sure. And the more, it's almost more horrifying the void itself than whatever monsters or creatures might actually be in the void. Sure, absolutely. You know, and again, it's almost like the Hitchcockian idea that whatever we can conjure up in our minds is going to be a hundred times worse than what could be actually constructed or put in a movie or a yeah. book or something, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, this this fear of what's out there. And also it makes it much more atmospheric too, you know. And I, I like the idea of implications because I think in horror fiction, the two best implicators are Lovecraft and M.R. James. Both of those authors, like, they implicate... It just by the implications, it just makes your imagination run wild. You know what I mean? It's just like, you don't even need them to fill in the rest of that sentence because your imagination just picks up and runs wild with it. And the thing, too, right, is that a lot of times... In, in both their works, it's the reader picks up on the implication before the narrator does, which makes it even more horrible because you feel so bad for this person. You're like, what are you walking into? What are you doing? You know, because the reader picks up on that implication because the, the, the character, for whatever reason, can't see it, right? If it's their own sort of prejudices, their own bias or whatever, but they can't see it where we can. And that's even more horrible, right? When you see something and you can't intervene and you can't help that person, that's horrible. Now, I know there were a couple short films made based on this story. I don't think there was ever a feature length film based on this right no i know there was one from 1980 one from 2009 yeah i think there was also one from 2012 that was a south korean film uh there was a 2016 short film adaptation i think one in 2019 as well have you seen any of the short films well it's funny because i i saw the one from 1980 i believe John, something with an S his last name is. And it's, it's like a student film, but it's actually quite good, except for the part where you get to see, because he actually shows you what's in the void. And it's really disappointing. You know, up to that point, it's very atmospheric. They did a really good job with it. But then you see what's in the void, and it's like this, like, hippie woman, like, dancing. I don't know if it was supposed to be, like, a callback to, like, Azatoth and the dancers around, you know. It, it just, it's, it's lame. When you, when you see it, you're like, this is what, you know, he's so afraid of. So I, it goes back to your point about implications being much worse than actually seeing or, be, or, or, or attempting to describe what this horror is. But it's funny that because when I was in Hofstra, when I was in film school, one of the classes we had to take was we had to pick a story or part of a story and we had to adapt it. That was the, you know, and we had a group and it was like we got three people together. Like one person was the director, one person was the cinematographer, and the other person did the sound. And one of the people in the class, one of the groups in the class actually did Eric Zahn, but they didn't finish it. Like, I remember they actually showed part of it in class for us, and it was like, you know, they had the part where they, like, it was actually shot in a dorm room. Okay. You know what I mean? And, um, yeah, but they they never finished it, so you didn't see the part with it. It was, like, halfway done, and they just screened, like, what the footage they had. Which is a shame. I should have talked to the guy more. He was a Lovecraft fan, you know, but, oh, well.
Well, obviously, I mean, a story about music. Imagine there must be an influence on people who read the story and become Lovecraft fans and, and later music. And um, I know there's an artist I really like named Jim Jupe, who's an um, electronic musician. Play, uh, you know, he actually runs a label called Ghost Box Records, and he actually put out an album um, under the pseudonym Eric Zahn. Which I think is it's really good. It's like it's like very like dark ambient kind of like spooky music and everything, very atmospheric. So yeah, I mean, there's even you know there's even the, the influence of this story on musicians, which you think there would be more, but yeah, check out the album. It's, yeah, Eric, he recorded under Eric Zahn. So for this section of the video, I'm joined by my friend Jeremy, and we're discussing the short story "The Terrible Old Man" by H.P. Lovecraft. Now, this was first published in 1921 in a magazine called Tryout, which I think was sort of like an amateur magazine, almost like a zine in a way. Uh, but what do you think of this story? Uh, it's pretty good. It's very short. And, uh, I mean, it's the literal definition of a short story. Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, I like to think of it as short, sweet, and to the point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, the story is about this old man. We never find out what his real name is or even how old he is, and you get the idea that the people in the town that the story takes place in don't even know this information. Like, all we really know about him is he was apparently a sea captain in the past, and, like, on his in his yard are what appear to be, like, statues of ancient gods, and... It appears that this old man sits on top of a very large fortune, and these thieves decide one night that they're going to rob the place. And let's just say it does not end well for the thieves. No, it does not. Again, because the story is so short, there's really not much we can say about it without giving too much away. Unless you want to get into spoilers, which I don't mind. I mean, the story's literally over a hundred years old now. I think with this you kind of have to because there's really not much to say other than the spoilers. Yeah, yeah. You, you kind of get the idea that this old man, I guess you could say is a demon or like there's sort of this implication at the end that he saw something at sea that sort of made him insane and also might have granted him some special abilities. In the story, he also has, like, these glass jars that he speaks to, and he dresses by different names, and it's never said flat out in the story, but from what I've heard, apparently mo some fans have speculated that those jars are filled with people's souls or something. I don't know if you got that implication or not. I didn't, but that is a pretty good guess. Yeah, I just thought the story was genuinely really creepy. I'm a fan of what I call minimalist horror, where on the surface it doesn't appear there's much to the story, but it's kind of left up for us to fill in the blanks, and Lovecraft I thought was really good at writing those kinds of horror stories. Richard Matheson is another writer who I think did a great job at those kinds of stories. Uh, but have you read anything else by Lovecraft? Uh... Honestly, no, I don't think I have. Yeah, so what did you think of this as your first Lovecraft story? I thought it was a good introduction to him. Yeah. Yeah, I do like in the story how uh, the thieves, they get what's coming to them. I, I hate thieves. <laughs> I've had people try to steal things from me, and it just made me... Oh, it made me mad. <laughs> Now, I don't know this for sure, because I have not read every single Lovecraft story, but I think the terrible old man from this story does show up in another Lovecraft story. Because Lovecraft, a lot of his stories were set within the same mythos. And I know, apparently in the early 70s, Marvel Comics did a, a horror anthology series, kind of like their answer to Tales from the Crypt. I forgot what it was called. I think it was, um, hold on. Uh, Tower of Shadows, and it was published... This story was adapted as one of the segments for the Tower of Shadows anthology for Marvel. And there were several short film adaptations of this story as well. I remember a kid I used to follow on YouTube did a short film based on this story that was pretty well done. And call me crazy, and I'm not the first person to make this comparison, but there are some similarities between this story and... You saw the movie Don't Breathe, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, think about it. I mean, that's also a story about an old man whose house is being robbed and the people robbing the house don't really know who they're fucking with. Obviously, that story is not supernatural at all, even though it might as well have been, considering a blind man shouldn't have been able to do half the things that Stephen Lang's character does in that movie. And actually, in speaking of comics, Alan Moore uh, did a Lovecraft-inspired comic book series called Providence, and the terrible old man actually does show up as a character at the end of that comic. Wow. But yeah, that's our very brief review of The Terrible Old Man. And then again, it's a very brief story, so there's not a whole lot to really discuss about it, but I do recommend it. I think it's a very short but very creepy little horror story. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. Now, this is not the end of the video. I decided to end this video off with a discussion on H.P. Lovecraft's influence on pop culture that I did with Bill. So, for this section of the video, I just want to talk about the influence that Lovecraft's work and his brand of cosmic horror has had on later horror movies and horror literature and just pop culture in general. Now, during Lovecraft's time, I know he was friends with Robert E. Howard, who incorporated a lot of aspects of Lovecraft's mythos into his own stories. And Robert Bloch, who would go on to write Psycho, wasn't he a protege of Lovecraft? Yes, very much so. I don't think they ever met. I think they were just um, correspondents. Yeah. But um, he, ba right, he based the character in Haunter in the Dark on Robert Bloch. That's interesting, yeah. honestly. Mm -hmm. And of course, later on, people like Stephen King were heavily influenced by Lovecraft. Like, Stephen King, I think, more so in the sense that a lot of King's stories have connections to them. There's a lot of fictional towns in Stephen King's work, very much like what Lovecraft did. But King did write a few Lovecraft-influenced stories, like Jerusalem's Lot, I Know What You Need, Grandma, and Revival. You could also see the influence of Lovecraft's work on... Authors like Alan Moore and Thomas Ligotti. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Alan Moore, I mean, I, one of the first times I heard about Lovecraft was in Alan Moore um, in in one of his stories, the one where um, it was John Constantine and his his sort of little group of people. And one of the guys actually says, like, you know, they know something's going to happen, like something's going to happen. Yeah. And one of the guys actually mentions it's going to be Cthulhu. So that was one of the first times I ever heard about Cthulhu. But yeah, I mean, Alan Moore and Stephen, you know, I think some of my favorite stories by Stephen King are the Lovecraftian stories. You know, I love Jerusalem's Lot, even though it's an early story by him. I think he picked up on the the mood and everything perfectly. He was a, perfectly able to do that. Another one who did early Lovecraft stuff is Ramsey Campbell. Yeah. He's like one yeah. of the all-time great author, you know, horror authors. And his, almost entirely, his early stories are all Lovecraft pastiches, you know. And unfortunately, like, later on, I think he kind of, like, he just, because I guess he was embarrassed by that, so he kind of, like, dismissed Lovecraft for a while. But... Subsequently, he's come back to Lovecraft, and he's actually done more Lovecraftian stories. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, but to me, yeah, I mean, Steve, Stephen King, Ramsey Campbell, Thomas Ligotti, um, very much so, his early stuff. He's kind of moved away from that in his later stuff, but again, his early stuff was very much in the Lovecraftian mode in terms of philosophy and in terms of, in terms of using language. Like his, his story, The Last Feast of the Harlequin, he actually dedicates to H.P. Lovecraft, yeah. and that's like his most Lovecraftian story he, he did. I haven't read anything by Ligotti, but I know he's like a hardcore nihilist, and it seems like it seems like that might be another connection to Lovecraft, that sense of nihilism. Yeah, I guess so, but the thing is, the, the difference is is that Lovecraft felt that the universe was indifferent, and Ligotti feels like the, love, the universe is actually actively out to get us. Oh, right. Like, there's like an evil, like, you know, he actually, so that's a big difference between the two. Like, Lovecraft would be, I think, would dismiss that. But, but yeah, Ligotti actually believes, like, the universe hates us. And we're almost like a, a like um like a virus or something, and the and the universe is trying to get rid of us. You know, we can't not talk about John Carpenter. John Carpenter was heavily influenced by Lovecraft. I mean, the thing, even though the thing wasn't based on a Lovecraft story, the thing is very Lovecraftian. Like that movie is almost pure cosmic horror, right? And to me, but to me, the ultimate Lovecraftian is Prince of Darkness. Yeah, like yeah. Prince of Darkness is like it, it's so Lovecraftian. And again, one of the things I like about Carpenter is that he didn't do a straight adaptation of any of Lovecraft's works, he, he builds in his own interest as well. I think that's what Lovecraft wanted people to do. Like, he didn't want people to imitate him. He wanted them to pick up on some of his ideas and then use them for their own creativity, which I think, again, in Prince of Dark, 
darkness. And the thing as well, of course, in, in the mouth of madness, right? There's a lot of Lovecraftian aspects of it. But to me, the perfect melding of atmosphere and philosophy has to be Prince of Darkness. That and the thing, I think, are my two favorite Carpenter yeah, films. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, another author that picked up on Lovecraft, which is weird because you wouldn't automatically uh, connect him with it, is Ful Fulci. Right, Lucio Fulci. There's a, he picked up on a lot of, lot of Lovecraft. Oh kind yeah, of things, yeah. You know? His uh, his uh, Gates of Hell trilogy. Right, absolutely. I you mean, know? Dunwich is literally the town that City of the Living Dead is. Set absolutely, in. yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because I was thinking when when you asked me to to talk about Eric Zahn, I started thinking to myself, who do I think would be a good director to do an adaptation, even if it was a short adaptation or like a Masters of Horror episode, you know? And I was thinking, you know, something even though the story itself is not graphic or extreme, I think Fulci would have done a great Eric Zahn because this. Something about Fulci's movies, he could show the most like sort of like everyday, you know, sequ uh, sequence or everyday sort of situation, and he makes it weird and eerie. And it's like you know, look, think about the end of the Beyond, right? With like where like they, like you know they go through the the gate of hell or whatever it is, the portal, or whatever, and then like looking at this landscape that's so like weird. You know, I can imagine like almost. Like when when the um when the, the the narrator goes close to the window in Eric Zahn and looks out the window, whatever. Like I can almost imagine it being like the end of the Beyond, like what the protagonist in the Beyond saw. Lovecraft was not like obviously a gore hound. I just think that that element of eeriness and, and weirdness, um, and, and just being off like off putting to things that just something's not quite right. Fulci did that really well. Grant Mortison did a very Lovecraftian comic called Nameless, and basically the main premise of that is what we always thought of as God was literally an alien from another dimension that was imprisoned by an ancient alien race, but this being's consciousness was sort of omnipresent throughout the universe, and this is literally what we always thought God was. Like, that's kind of the main premise of Nameless. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, I've never, I've never read it, but it sounds great. Yeah. Grant Morrison's brilliant, so, you know, he's going to do something great with that. In the past, like, ten years, ten or so years, there's been kind of a rise in Lovecraftian horror films or cosmic horror. Like, just this year, you had The Outwaters, uh, The Void you had a few years ago. Um, you had the show Lovecraft Country, which is obviously based on Lovecraft. And you've seen Underwater, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, Cthulhu literally shows up at the end of yeah, Underwater. Yeah, that was cool. That was the best part of the movie. Of course, we had Richard Stanley's adaptation of Color Out of Space. Mm -hmm. And even the first season of True Detective, I think, is very Lovecraftian. I love that. I think that's one of the best seasons of TV I ever saw. And it be, it's because of bringing in those Lovecraftian, some people would say Lagadian, right? Some people said that a lot of that stuff was right out of Thomas Lagadi, which of course he got from Lovecraft. But I, the, I love that series because you had, again, you had sort of this melding of cosmic horror and folk horror that yeah. came together in that story. And I, those are my two favorite kinds of horror, so I was like in heaven. Or hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I also like how True Detective is, the first season at least, is not overtly supernatural. It's the philosophy of Lovecraft, that sense of existential dread that you get from Lovecraft's work. It's not about big tentacled monster. It's like, his stories is really about what the big tentacled monster represents. Right, right. And again, the way they did it in True Detective was brilliant because they didn't just come out and say that. Like, you, you know, the, Russ, you know, Cole walks you through everything. And he, just the way he, he does it so methodically, right? I think Lovecraft would have loved that. You know what I mean? I think just the methodical. And he, it's a weird thing. He uses logic and reason to prove irrationality and, you know, unreason. You know what I mean? Like, but he used, you know, I thought it was brilliant. I, I thought it was, it was such a great distillation of what Lovecraft maybe was moving to if he had kept writing. You know what I mean? Like, you know, if he had not died, if he had kept writing, maybe that's sort of where he was moving to in that sort of sense of, um, that sort of slowly unveiling these, you know, these horrors to us rather than sticking them right in your face. Yeah. Right now, probably the most influential American author of all time, which is amazing that here's this guy that and I feel so bad for him, too, because right, he, he stopped writing the last two years of his. He thought he was such a failure and that he was such a terrible writer. He actually stopped writing. He helped other people. He would like do revisions and stuff. But like, his last story really was um, uh, Hunter in the Dark, which was 1935. and He died in 1937. So the last two years of his life, he felt like he was a failure. He couldn't even pick up a pen to write. And, it's, and, and to think... 
right? The, the influence he's had since then, you know what I mean? It's just amazing. But again, I, I wish, you know, we often, we, Christian and I often talk about, like, if we never met, like, famous people, like, you know, who would we meet? What would we talk about? And I, I, I would love to have, love, like, I would love to have met Lovecraft or meet Lovecraft and just be able to tell him the influence he had that you weren't a failure, you know, you were more of a success than you even imagined because not just, not, and not just in sense of like selling books or, or rights to things and, you know, making money, but in, in inspiring people in the, in the imaginations and, you know, and getting people to, to be creative. I mean, that's amazing. So I think that he is, he's my favorite author. I, I you know, I think he's just a brilliant, a brilliant man. And, um, you know, I, I, I imagine that as we go forward that he's only going to get more influential. So yeah, that was my review of Gothic Tales by H.P. Lovecraft and bye.